Well, y'all, I'm super excited. I've got to dive in because I don't have a lot of time and I have a very long message. And so um, I do need your help today. Everybody say, I'm going to help you, Pastor. Yeah, so we're in week three of a collection of messages that has been called When Church Don't Work. Everybody say, When Church Don't Work. And so what I, I, I told you how the Lord birthed this in my spirit. And, uh, and man, I, how many of you would be honest and say that the last two weeks has really been stretching you a little bit? Okay, fantastic. Well, we're going to get stretched a little bit more today. If you've missed the first two weeks, let me let you play catch up. So we're talking about what are things that are going on inside of the church that's stopping it from working as it should. Week one, I preached about our view on the church. Sometimes inside the church, we have a bad view, and our view is that we come to church just to receive, when really the, the goal of church is to come to train to be the soldiers and the warriors that Christ has for us to be. Somebody say amen. And so if you're only coming to consume and to receive, then, then church is not working for you. Amen? And so it could be working if you shift your mentality a little bit and begin to use what you're learning to serve and reach others. But as of right now, it's not working for you when that's our mindset. Other, other mindsets outside of the church that's stopping people from receiving what they should in church is the fact that the church is just full of a bunch of hypocrites. Um, the church is full of right-wing um, bigots. The church is full of people that are just going to judge me. In some cases, that is the scenario, but that's not in all cases. And everybody said? Amen. And so we've been talking about things that are stopping the church from working as it should. My wife preached last week because we were gone. Um, Y'all, I just want to tell you about my, my, my week last week. I left on Thursday, left, pulled out of Clawson on Thursday at 11 o'clock, pulled into Clawson on Sunday night, at midnight, okay? That's 85 hours. Everybody say 85 hours. Okay, 85 hours. Out of those 85 hours, we were driving for 59 of them. So our Idaho family is no longer our Idaho family. Would you give it up for our new Texas family? Johnny and Tracy and Beth, the family. And so uh, super, it was, it was not a bad drive on the way there, but driving the U-Haul on the way home, it snowed through the entire state of New Mexico. It was terrible. If you never drove in snow with a U-Haul with a trailer on it, I'll just tell you, it's terrible. Uh, and so, uh, but it was worth it because our people are home. Somebody say amen. So last week, my wife preached about, so I was gone last week. Last week, my wife preached about people. People can be the biggest issue in the church, but people can also be and are the biggest asset in the church. Because when people get on fire and stirred up for Jesus, there is no stopping them whenever they're going out in the darkness. Amen? And so people are the biggest challenge and people are the biggest asset. Today, I'm going to preach a message on false teaching, false beliefs, and false prophets. False teaching, false beliefs, and false prophets. The truth is that more than ever, I see in the church globally, uh, people are being indoctrinated. Churches are being indoctrinated. People through YouTube preachers and TV preachers are being indoctrinated with false teaching. And if you believe that there's no way that Satan can indoctrinate or come into Clawson with some false teaching, then you are inaccurate. And so uh, let me tell you, one of the biggest challenges pastor over the last three years is stopping false teaching from coming into the church. Let me give you a couple over the last three years that have tried to infiltrate the church. Um, a few years ago, there was um, a, a little bit of a teaching that was going on in some of our people that it was not only okay, well, that it was okay to use certain types of drugs if, if they were naturally grown on the earth, like pot and mushrooms. Like Not only was it natural for you and good for you to use them, but whenever you use them, you get closer to God. Because when you use them, you open up this supernatural window that gets you to where you can communicate with the creator better. Uh, let me just go ahead and say, y'all, I'm going to say it right here. That's false. I just need one scripture to show you that that's false. You ready? There's a scripture. I believe it's in Peter, but Paul, it may have been Paul. It says, be sober minded. Okay. If I am eating mushrooms, I am not sober minded. I probably have opened the spiritual window. But it wasn't a spiritual window that's got me closer to the creator. <laughs> Let's be careful now. It says, so what, what I had to do was destroy that before that came in and people begin to follow that. Another teaching right now, very recently, that has tried to come into our church is this hyper grace movement. 
Right now, there's this massive hyper grace movement. And what this grace movement is saying is that Jesus, his, the grace of Jesus covers, which this is accurate, covers our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. That's an accurate statement. His grace covers us. But then this movement, what they're saying is that you no longer have to feel bad for your sin because his grace covers you. You no longer have to ask and confess for your sin because his grace covers you. Because his grace covers you, you no longer, like you don't have to to receive forgiveness for those things. And so listen, and David said that you, let's see, you, oh gosh, I lost it. The broken heart one. You want us to have a broken heart. God wants you to feel bad when you do something stupid. You should feel bad when you do something stupid. And so this hyper grace movement that's saying you should not feel bad. You should just experience what it is. Is it saying you can live however you want. You can do whatever you want. And as long as you've received Jesus, his grace is covering you. That's not true. It's not true. It will not be taught in this church. It's everywhere right now, but it will not be taught here. You know why? Because it's false. Listen to me. I want you to hear this. The church doesn't work as it should if what we're believing is false. And so let's dive in. Um, I believe with all my heart that we are seeing pastors either intentionally or maybe unintentionally lie all the time when they're leading people falsely. Um, I believe that lying is a big deal to God. In in our family, lying is a big deal. Let me tell you a funny story before I dive in. Um, So lying, when I was raised, lying was actually got you in a lot more trouble than whatever you did. So I saw this with my older brother and sister. They lied a lot. And so they would, and it's a true story. And so they would get in trouble for something, but if they lied, then they would get in like quadruple trouble. So I was like, bro, I ain't trying to get in quadruple trouble. I'm just gonna tell them what I did. And so for me, usually it was, hey, Josh, did you do this? Yep. And then they're like, okay, well, he didn't lie. He gets like two spankings when they're getting like 76 spankings. And so I'm, I'm loving life, you know? And so as we were building up our kids, like what we're trying to figure out how to discipline them and all the things, one of the things with us was if you did something to get spankings, you usually got two to three spankings. And then if you lied about it, then you're gonna get five more. And so you get double the amount or a little over double the amount for lying. So don't lie about it. So we're trying to build this don't lie thing. And I'll never forget, I guess that I lied to y'all last night with the wrong kid. It was Aiden that did this last night. I said Canaan did it. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, But Aiden stole a a fidget spinner from one of his friend's house. He came home and the dad called me and was like, hey, bro, I think that your kid stole my kid's fidget spinner. It looks like this. And so I see Aiden, you know, doing this little fidget spinner. And so I said, Aiden, where'd you get that fidget spinner? And he starts telling this elaborate story of how his buddy at school was just so cool that he gave him this fidget spinner and just blah, 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 blah. And so I was like, Aiden, bro, you lied about it. David already called me. And he was like, oh. And so I was like, hey, Christy. So Christy comes in, we tell her the story and she's like, all right, you're going to get spankings. She's like, well, how many spankings am I going to get? And she says, well, you're going to get two spankings for still in the fidget spinner. Then you're going to get five spankings for lying. So he's like, I'm getting seven spankings. And she's like, yeah, you're getting seven spankings. She's like, okay, okay. So he's like counting one, two, three. I think about four, Christy decided that seven was not enough. And so as she's going, five, six, Seven, he thinks it's done. Eight, uh, uh. and then, you know, he's like, mom, mom, that's eight, mom, that's nine, mom, that's 10. And she stops on 10 and he gets, I mean, he gets plum mad and he turns around and he says, you said I was getting seven spankings. And she says, how does it feel to be lied to? <laughs> Lying's a big deal, y'all. Big deal in the Pogue House. Parents, some of y'all parents, y'all want to use that, I'm telling you. Oh, hey, y'all, I'm going to ask the Lord to bless our time this morning, and then I'm going to dive in. And um, before I dive in, I just want to say, if I preach a little bit late and you have to go, I I feel like I'm probably going to go a little late, and you have to go, feel free to go. Uh, (laughs) This church is super casual, and if you have time restraints and you have to take off, I may not, I don't know. Uh, But sometimes uh, if you need to go, feel free. Don't feel like guilt and shame and all that jazz. Just if you got to go, take off. It's cool. Uh, But I just wanted to make you aware. Worship went a little long. That's cool. We want it to. We want to follow whatever the Lord wants to do. And so um, if I go a little long, just you can expect that. But let's pray. Let's pray that the Lord speaks to us today. Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now. Lord, I pray that you would, um, God, that you would just speak to every single person in this room. I pray today that you would use me as a vessel to give the word that you have for the church today. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every single person in this room. 
And Lord, I love you and I thank you and I praise you in your precious name. I pray. And everybody said? All right, y'all, let's dive in. False teaching, false beliefs, false prophets. I want to talk real quickly about false prophets. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter, chapter 7, in verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets, prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. Let me tell you a mistake that I think that we make in the church quite a bit. And so I want to challenge you maybe to not make this mistake anymore. I think we make this mistake in the church that everyone that believes something or teaches someone a little bit differently than I do, they're a false prophet. (laughs) You ever heard somebody say that? Well, they're a false prophet and they're a false prophet and they believe this. And so they're a false prophet and that denomination believes this. So their teachers are false prophets. And I think that we use that phrase uh, in a way that's not actually intended to be used. Uh, let me give you a little bit of an example. I bet there's probably 400, 450 of us in this room uh, today. I bet that we can't find two of us in this room that agrees on everything. And so what you're saying whenever you say that is every person in this room that doesn't believe exactly the way that I believe, they're a false prophet. I don't believe that's accurate. And so we, my dad and I are both pastors, okay? Uh, my dad and I do not believe 100% the exact same way when it comes to the scriptures. And let me tell you something, that's okay. It's okay. We still believe that Jesus came. We still believe that Jesus died. We still believe that Jesus is king. Both of us are following Jesus' plans for our lives. And we're both good teachers, I think. I hope. And so listen, listen. So I I think we make this mistake, especially denomination versus denomination. We make this mistake that everybody that doesn't do it and think it and teach it and believe it exactly the way that I do, they're a false prophet. And I just want to call baloney on that. That's not true. And I want to show you why that is. And Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but really the ravenous wolves. I believe that there are so many pastors out there that have been indoctrinated into things that are a little bit false, but they're still on team Jesus. I probably have been indoctrinated into things that were a little bit false, but I still, I'm following Jesus. I'm trying to learn everything that Jesus has for me, walk out the plan that he has for me. But listen, if they are not a ravenous wolf with the intention to destroy the church and their intention is to build up the church, they're not a false prophet. And we should not be calling them false prophets. We should just say, it's okay for us to disagree. Amen? Amen. So I, I put together what I thought would be fun. Uh, it's state borders versus national borders. So a national border would mean somebody that is not in the kingdom of heaven, okay? So if you're an American, if you're a part of the 50 states, you're an American. Uh, but Texas and California, we don't agree on everything. Right? And so, and so listen, uh, I, I wanna go over some, some things and I want you to tell me, is this a national, what do you mean when I say national and state? A state border means that they can believe that differently and they're still a part of the kingdom of God. A national border means I don't believe with what I believe, I don't believe that they're a part of the kingdom of God, okay? So let's go over a couple of borders. So if someone, I want you to tell me, is this a state or a national issue? Okay. If someone says that they are a follower of Christ or believe in God or are serving God and they do not believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, is that state or national? Okay, that's a national issue. If you don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, you're probably not going there, right? Okay, let's go over another one. Um, yeah. If someone is a follower of Christ and they believe differently about how you should dress in church, Okay, state issue. This next one's the funnest one for me because I think it's, well. If someone says that they're a follower of Christ, but they're a flat earther. Y'all think they can't go to heaven if they're a flat earther? (laughs) State issue. It's funny because there's some flat earthers in the room, y'all. I just think it's super funny. It's, we argue about the dumbest things. Um, listen, if you believe Jesus is king and are walking out Jesus is playing for you, as dumb as I may think it is, you can believe that the earth is flat and still go to heaven. It's a state issue. Okay, so let me give you one more and then we're gonna move on with the message. Uh, if someone says that they are a gay, a bi, or a tri-sexual Christian, is that a state or national? National. So some of you may be sitting in here thinking, why is that one national? I just want to elaborate real quick uh, because I don't like to throw just groups of people under the bus. Um, I would say that it is a national issue in our church, what we believe and what we teach. If you're living a lifestyle that 
distinctly goes against what Jesus teaches, that's a national issue. So if, now listen to me, if you are a racist, that's a national issue. You cannot be a racist and be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? If you're a drunkard, that's a national issue. The Bible actually says no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Does that mean if you make a mistake and get drunk, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven? No. That means somebody that lives that lifestyle is not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. If you are living any type of lifestyle that is against what Jesus teaches, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That is a what kind of issue? National issue. Okay, so let's dive back in. Um, I believe that there are three things that we see very commonly taught in the church today that I want us to go over and I want us to talk about because I do not want you to allow them, these false teaching and these false beliefs to get into your life. And number one, if you're taking notes, is a compromised gospel. A compromised gospel. I see this more and more and more and more today than I ever have before. Um. Let me give you some truth, y'all. The gospel of Jesus, it's, it's a little bit offensive. It's offensive. If you are a sinner that loves your sin and don't think that you need a savior, for you to come tell me that I need to get out of my sin and I do need a savior, that's offensive. Is it not? And so what we're seeing when I say a compromised gospel is we're seeing people that are taking the offense out of the scriptures and the offense out of the gospel to make people think and believe that they can live the life that they want to live. They can be gay. They can be tri. They can be a drunkard. They can be a racist. They can be whatever it is. And, and they can be covered. We're milking down and watering down the gospel so much that the gospel is no longer powerful. It's a false gospel. It's not even just a compromised gospel. It's a false gospel. Everybody say false. false. Jude chapter 3. I said chapter three last night. There's only got one chapter in Jude. Verses three through four. It says, dear friends, I've been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation that we share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's mar marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. What is he saying? Here's what he's saying, that people are worming their way into the church to water down the gospel and to make it seem like they can live whatever life they want to live and be safe. And I want to be here. I want to tell you truth. And the truth is that that is a lie. Amen. Amen. That's a lie. In Galatians, he deals with this issue with the church of Galatia. I want to read you one more scripture and then we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit. Galatians chapter one, verses six through 12. Paul says, I am shocked that you are turning away from God so soon. Who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that, that pretends to be the good news. But it is not the good news at all. Everybody say at all. It is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning God. Let God curse anyone. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one that we preach to you. I say this again. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one that you welcome, let that person be cursed. And this is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God, because if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's follower. That scripture scares the heck out of me. I intentionally preach things to make sure that I'm not pleasing you because I, I, I want to be Christ's servant. Amen? Amen? So what is the gospel? What's the gospel? I just want to give you a quick piece of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came. He died. He was resurrected from the dead. And the only way that you and I can be saved is for us to follow Jesus Christ with our lives. The only way, there is no other way. Somebody say amen. amen. It's offensive. But I'm gonna let it be offensive to you because it's the truth. It transforms us when there is a gospel message, when there is a compromised gospel being preached, a watered down gospel, a go it's a gospel that's no longer true. Because I love you, I'm gonna give you the real thing every time. As you're listening to people 
on YouTube, on Facebook, on whatever it is that you listen to, be careful. Be careful because I hear that message more and more and more, more every single day. Number two in your notes is this. Second thing that keeps the church from working as it should is the twisting of scriptures. The twisting of scriptures. And I I think that probably this happens more unintentionally than it does intentionally. What do I mean when I say twisting scripture? Scripture is truth. You believe that? So when you take a piece of truth out of context and you make that piece of truth mean what you want it to mean and it doesn't actually mean what it meant in context, it's no longer truth. And that's what I say whenever I am talking about twisting scripture. This is actually one of the funnest things for me because I've seen scriptures twisted my whole life and it trips me out. So let me give you a scripture. Let's have some fun. You want to have some fun? Yeah. Okay. There's a scripture in Leviticus 19, 28 that says this. Do not cut your bodies for the dead and do not mark your skin with tattoos. I am the Lord. Okay, so question. Does the Bible say, it's not a trick question. Does the Bible say, do not mark your skin with tattoos? Okay, it does. Oh God. Does the Bible say, okay, the, 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 the scriptures say, do not mark your skin with tattoos. Yes, but what we've done is what we've pulled that scripture out and said, if you get a tattoo, that's a sin for you. How many of you have ever heard that? A tattoo for you is a sin. Okay, so that is, in it's one of its most best forms, a great twisting of the scripture. Let me show you why. Because we talked, remember we talked about last week how everybody outside of the church says, the reason that I don't go to church is because the church is full of hypocrites. Okay, let me show you. Let me read you some, uh, some other areas in Leviticus 19, okay? Leviticus 19 says, you must always observe the Sabbath days of rest. How many of you stop everything that you're doing every Saturday and you observe that Saturday day of rest? Oh, snap. I feel like we have maybe a liar. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, how about this one? Do not trim the hair off of your temples or trim your beards. Guys, if you shave this morning, okay, how about this one? Do not plant your fields with two different kinds of seeds. How about this one? Do not wear clothes woven from two different kinds of materials. Now, why is what I'm saying important? Some of you are sitting there thinking, well, he's just trying to defend his tattoos. (laughs) That's what some of you are sitting there thinking. Now, I, I want to stop you for a second because here's what's happened in my life. I've been preached to and preached to and preached to when somebody took a scripture out of context. And I want to say this because this is how I grew up thinking in my mind because I couldn't figure out why you pull that one scripture out and throw it at me. And then 50% of Leviticus 19, you don't live by. And so if you have a shirt on that is cotton and polyester and you're preaching and teaching to people that a tattoo is wrong because of Leviticus 19, you are a part of the reason that the church doesn't work because you're a hypocrite. Let's do another one. You want to do another one? Twisting of scripture. When you take and you twist scripture and you make it what you want, it is dangerous. People hate the church because we've taken and twisted scripture and they've taken the Bible and proved you wrong. And then said, they just take whatever pieces out that they want and live by it. And I ain't doing that. Hey, if you're going to live by it, live by it. I got mad respect for you if you're going to live by all of Leviticus 19. I believe that Jesus came and freed us from that. In fact, Hebrews tells us that Jesus came and freed us from that. But if you want to preach it, you want to live it, that's up to you. But if you're not living all of it, a little bit of a hypocrite. Okay, let's do another one. Here we go. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. I'm about to make a few people angry. How's that scripture taken out of context? Listen, Proverbs was written as principles for us to live by. It was not written as promises that are 100% gonna happen. Now, why is it dangerous? We've taken that scripture and made it a promise. Like, if I do this, this is certainty. But if you take all of the Proverbs and you read them, what you will see is that they're not all 100% certainty. Uh, So there's wealth proverbs 
And if the wealth proverbs were 100% certainty, Job would not have lost all of his stuff. Right? But there's all these Proverbs. Proverbs was principles to live by, not promises that you can hold on to. Now, here's what I'm doing. What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying, why is this important? It's important because when somebody takes that as a promise from God that cannot be wrong, what happens is when you're 65 years old, if you have a child that dies and they didn't give their life to Jesus and you've been standing on that as a promise for your whole entire life, now you think God's a liar. And he's not a liar but you took something out of context that was not meant to be a promise. Here's what I will promise you. You ready? My mom and dad, they raised me this way and they prayed this over my life. And I believe with all of my heart that God's presence was following me where probably sometimes he just wanted to kick me out because my mom was praying, because my mom was lifting up that scripture, because my mom was bringing to the Lord how she raised me. I believe the Holy Spirit was always, come on, Josh, quit being an idiot. Come on, Josh, quit being an idiot. And one day I stopped being an idiot. She said, well, pastor, if it's not a promise, what's the point in me doing it? Because God will continue to move on your children as you raise them the right way. That's a promise. But whenever you take that as a promise, you're actually taking away your child's free choice. And we don't get to do that. They have free choice. Amen? Amen. Okay. I warned you, I'm not gonna look at the time. This is a super fun topic for me because I, I have taken scriptures that people have preached and just, take, just put them in context and went, what the heck, man? You can't preach that that way. Uh, but can I, can I, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you take that scripture out of context, what you think is that God is just gonna let you do all things. What Paul is actually talking about there is that it's all about persecution. So he's saying, Satan is coming against me. All hell's coming against me. This has happened to me. And because Christ and his strength is in me, I can make it through any persecution that Satan comes at me. But when you take that scripture out of context, what you think is I can get a Ferrari and I can get this house and God's gonna bless me here. And that's out of context. You see how important that is? Hey, can I be super vulnerable with you? It's easy to do it. Last year, I took something way out of context. Uh, I preached to you. How many of y'all remember the message where I was talking about dove's dung? <laughs> Do y'all remember that? And, uh, and, and I used like a big portion of the message as some comedy, like what the heck would you be doing with bird poop? Uh, and so like in the scriptures, it said, and in the, in the city, they were selling a cup of dove's dung for this amount of money. And I was like, what the, heck? are they eating bird poop? Like what is going on with this? So I did this whole thing on, 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 you know, preaching about dove's dung because it says in the Bible, dove's dung. And I looked up dung and it, there wasn't anything in there, but it said poop. <laughs> and then three days later, I found out that dove's dung is not bird poop. It's a plant. And then I felt real dumb. And then Dalen made this little thing making fun of me. Y'all saw it probably on Facebook. Dove's dung, dove's dung, dove's dung. <laughs> made me look ignorant. You know why? Because I was ignorant. <laughs> I didn't know what dove's dung was and I preached it like I did. So what am I saying? I'm saying, guys, you gotta have grace. You've gotta, you've gotta have grace. Because sometimes you dive into the scriptures, you go into the scriptures, but it's super, super important what you believe, who you listen to, what you allow to get inside of, your, uh, of, inside of your head, inside of your life, because pastors and people, what they're doing is they're twisting scripture to please people. And remember what Paul said. He said, if I was preaching to please you, if I was living my life to please people, I would not be Christ's servant. It scares me for pastors and leaders that do that. All right, 2 Timothy chapter four, verses three through four says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Most people are looking for someone that's gonna to teach to them what they wanna hear. 
And what they're going to do is they're going to jump from church to church, pastor to pastor, leader to leader, until they find someone that's preaching what they want to hear. Then they're going to stay there. That's not what you need to hear. What you need to hear is something that's going to change you, transform you, get you on the path that God has for you. Somebody say amen. Okay. So we've talked about a compromised gospel. We've talked about the twisting of scripture. Number three, allowing culture to infiltrate the the church instead of the church infiltrating the culture. Now, I want to read Romans 12, verse 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will for you is, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A um, little bit of vulnerability. Our church actually gets um, a pretty bad rep here. Um, I heard some of it this morning in our, in our prayer room. We get accused of being a church that has allowed culture to infiltrate the church. Because of things like dimming the lights during worship and jumping and partying and having fun and having fun lives and having modern worship songs and playing games in the service and giving away $5,000 vacations or a thousand bicycles or the pastor having tattoos or backwards hat. So, So what they've done is they've taken those types of things and they've said, well, that church is a worldly church. They've taken Romans chapter 12, verse two, and said, uh, don't allow, um, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. The issue that I have with that is that when Paul was talking about those customs and when he was talking about don't allow, um, I don't see anywhere where Paul is talking about the things that they say is worldly in our church. Like I, I think you need to go based off of a definition of worldly. Because when Paul talks, if you look at all of Paul's teachings, if you look at all of Jesus's teachings, he's not talking ever about lights. He's not talking about worship styles, not talking about dress wear. What is he talking about? Paul, one of the things that he talks about a lot with customs infiltrating the church is sexual impurity. And we see so many churches that are just bringing in sexual impurity. Common law marriage, y'all, it's not marriage. It's not. Shacking up will never be okay with God. You can't choose to be gay or bi or whatever and expect the Bible should change with you because the culture did. This is the attitude of our culture today. And it is what Paul is talking about when he's saying when you're allowing the customs and behaviors of the world to come into the church, he's talking about those things. He's talking about the flesh versus the spirit. When you live by the spirit of God versus the flesh, then you got the spirit moving. When you move by the flesh, you're allowing the customs and the things of the world to, be, to, to infiltrate you in the church. He's talking about the living in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He's talking about how we treat people. And when we're allowing those things to come into the church, and infiltrate the church, what's happening is the church is not working as it should. Amen? Amen. Okay, so I ran out of time. I wanna close this whole message by answering this question. How do I make sure that I'm not following false teaching? I think it's a great question because there's so many people Preach. I listen to usually two to three messages per week. How do I make sure that what I'm listening to is, is founded in the word and that people aren't twisting scripture and those kind of things? And so I have four things that I want to give you real quickly. Number one, I want to encourage you to do this. Um, don't look for what you want. Look for truth. It's so easy to, oh, I think that maybe... That's what that means. So let me go find, ooh, he did not preach it that way. Let's go to the next guy. Oh, he did not preach it that way. Let's go. It's so easy to go, let me find what I want. And I want to encourage you, don't look for what you want. Look for truth. Secondly, I want to encourage you with this. Learn the word of God. I said, when I got saved, uh, I was so fed up of people twisting scripture that when I got saved, I said, you know what? I'm just going to trash my beliefs. I'm going to open the Bible and I'm going to figure out what it is that I believe based off of the scripture and the Holy Spirit that's living inside of me. And I just begin to dig. And that's why it became very comical to me going over some of the scriptures and the context of scriptures and then saying people have preached this this way. Oh my gosh, that wasn't even close to what it was supposed to be. It's not even close to what he was talking about. 
And so I want to encourage you, do the same. You can't, you can't know if what I'm giving you is true or not if you don't know your Bible. I promise you, I could give it to you in a way that you'd believe it. You need to know that it's truth. Only way you're going to know that it's truth is if you know the word. Number three, test everything. Every preacher that you're listening to, every teacher that you're listening to, you know what I found? Before I ever go to the Bible, when I'm listening to teaching, when something that's not right gets taught, something inside of me goes, eh, I just, I'm just not sure about that. Anybody ever had that happen? I'm just not sure. I'm not sure how I believe about that. And when you have that feeling rise up inside of you, it's probably the Holy Spirit. And so what should you do? You should open up the Bible and go, I need to figure out if that's true or not. And then lastly, number four, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth is, I believe more than ever before, we're full of churches of people that don't know the truth. And they're literally just going off of what their pastor says. So if my pastor says a tattoo is wrong, dead gum, it is wrong. If my pastor preached that he was wrong and a tattoo is okay, it's okay. If my pastor preached that the Holy Spirit's done, he's done. If my pastor preached, so we're, we're basing our information, we're basing our beliefs off of people and not God. Oh my gosh, that's scary, y'all. Don't do that. Don't even do it with me. I messed up last year. I'm probably going to mess up again sometime this year. Not on purpose, but it happens. I'm sure you've messed up too. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. So you need to know the word, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Will you stand with me today? Right before I came up to preach, somebody came up to me and said, there's a, there's an anointing of miracles, four miracles today. And so if you're here today and you need a miracle, I just, I want to encourage you, build your faith right now and get ready. Because I believe God's about to do some cool things. If you're here and you're one of our, our altar workers, would you step out and come right now? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and let me close this thing out? Y'all know some of the stuff that I talked about today is pretty heavy. Here's what I know. I know as I was growing up, I got hurt a lot in church. I'm about to start a, a collection of messages when I get back from Florida in two weeks called I Hate You and It's Killing Me. And it's all about unforgiveness. And, and I believe that the reason that I'm gonna have to start that is because a lot of us are dealing with bitterness and unforgiveness. If you're here today and God's been speaking to you throughout this message, if you're here today and you need a supernatural touch from the Lord, if you're here today, maybe you're here today and you have been following a compromised gospel, a gospel that has not changed you and it has not transformed you, and you say, Pastor, I want to allow God, I want the real gospel to get in me and change me and transform me. I want to follow the path that Jesus has for me. If you're here today and you need something from God, in just a minute, our worship team is going to lead us, and I want to encourage you to step out and come. Or I want to encourage you to come and step out and come. Find a place where you can get alone with the Lord and allow him to do what he wants to do in you. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. Lord, I pray that you would move in a mighty way. God, I pray that you would anoint this place with miracles. God, as our team's getting ready to pray, Father, that miracles, healing, God, would take place this morning, whatever it is that you want to do, that you would transform our lives, that you would transform our bodies, that you would transform our minds. You do what only you can do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Step out and come right now. If you need prayer, you need a miracle, you need God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, you need something from the Lord, step out and come right now.